Hello. In the past I have shown you which kinds of useful parts can be salvaged from printers, scanners, copy machines, microwave ovens, washing machines and other equipment. Today I will show you a quick teardown of this German made Miele brand dishwasher. I will take a look at many of its components, name them and give some information about their function. But other than in past episodes, I will not just make suggestions about how to reuse them, but also put my ideas to the test right away. So let's not waste any time and get right into it. First of all, all the loose parts inside are taken out of the machine. Then, the white steel sheets that cover the two sides of the dishwasher are being unscrewed. In order to remove the heavy door of the device, I tilt it over. But before I can remove the door entirely, it has to be disassembled itself first, since it holds some electronic components, including the entire control circuitry of the dishwasher. With the door gone, I remove the metal plate on the bottom of the enclosure, freeing the view on the majority of the electromechanical parts on which the machine relies. Now, Basically all parts are accessible and can be removed from the steel frame. And in this way I go on to strip clean the bottom and the sides of the dishwasher, leaving behind its bare stainless steel frame. The power switch and the control circuits of the device are encapsulated inside this metal enclosure from inside the door. The dishwasher's single PCB is also protected by this plastic case. We will take a look at the electronic components and perform various experiments later in this video. But because I want to make room in my shop before proceeding, I will now first deal with the largest part, the enclosure itself. In the past I used to just throw it away, but this time I want to repurpose the metal frame itself. And that's why I will now attempt to make an equipment cabinet out of it. In order to do that I clean the insides and outsides of the enclosure as good as I can. Now I reinstall this angle plate and the bottom sheet. All parts that strengthen the integrity of the frame should be put back on. Next I remove the rather flimsy sliding rails of the dishwasher, because I want to replace them with these really rugged ball bearing rails that I salvaged from a copy machine a few weeks ago. For that I mark the enclosure and drill some holes through the stainless steel sheets. Next I cut an old piece of wood with my jigsaw so that it will fit inside the enclosure. In order to install the ball bearing rails I also need two additional wooden bars. In an earlier life they served as table legs. Next I pre-drill the bars and screw the rails on top. Next. I fasten the rails and bars inside the enclosure with nuts and bolts. And with everything sitting in place I screw the wooden plate to the bars, installing the board inside the enclosure. And it works just fine. Since I have so much space at the bottom, but no more ball bearing rails, I simply made another board from some construction wood that will simply sit down here. Next I reinstall the white steel sheets. And because this enclosure doesn't have a top cover, I will install this stainless steel sheet, salvaged from some old washing machine, on top. And after drilling some more holes into the sheet and into the frame, I screw it in place. And to put this makeshift equipment cabinet to the test, I insert some devices which happen to be lying around here. And as you can see, the ball bearing rails are stable enough to hold this super heavy UPS in place. I also put the entire thing on this dolly here, just to make it easier to move. It might also be a good idea to reinforce the bottom sheet and then permanently install wheels to it. There might be several ways to improve this, but this type of video is not supposed to deliver perfect solutions. It's just about proof of concept. Ok, so I'd say it's about time to take a look at the salvaged components. The stuff you see here was designed to serve a very special purpose inside the dishwasher and at least I have no interesting ideas for them. Since these parts are from an expensive Miele machine however, I might just put them on eBay. More interesting are the electronic components that you see on this bench right here. I will now quickly go through some of the simpler and more common parts and I will then present some ideas concerning those parts that I found more interesting. This is a flow heater. As the name implies, it is nothing but a large resistive element that gives off heat to the water that is flowing through it. Attached to the flow heater are two thermo switches. A thermo switch that is connected in series with the heating element will cut it off the grid once a certain temperature is reached and it will only close again once its temperature has fallen under a certain value again. It is a very primitive, 
yet reliable regulating mechanism. This is the relay that was used to switch the flow heater on and off. Since it is rated for a switching current of 16 amperes at 250 volts, it could be reused for a variety of high power applications. Yet the fact that the electromagnet inside is also rated for 200 to 240 volts AC makes it less useful, at least for my purposes. This is a filter component that consists of two center tapped series capacitors and a resistor. And here is the on-off switch of the dishwasher. The fact that it comes with two screw holes at the front makes it also easily reusable. One downside is though that I cannot find a current rating on it. This component is a pressure switch and we have been talking about it before when I made my video about washing machine parts. If you want to find out what it does, simply blow some air into the hose that is attached to it. Furthermore, we find this fan, which is powered by a shaded pole induction motor, and this so-called lye or extrusion pump, another part that you can also find in washing machines. But let's leave that behind and take a closer look at the PCB. What we see here is a very straightforward design. A potted mains transformer, a rectifier bridge and a large electrolytic capacitor comprise an old-fashioned conventional power supply. It most probably delivers a DC voltage around 12 volts required to energize the relays on this board. Next to the power supply we find an MC33163 PWM controller or you might also call it an integrated switching regulator or switcher IC because it also has an integrated power transistor. It is designed to build DC to DC converters with minimal external component count. In conjunction with this choke, diode and electrolytic capacitor, it comprises a DC to DC converter. At first glance, I would say it's a buck converter, deriving a regulated logic level supply rail from the unregulated conventional power supply. And up here we find an m 38027 m 8 8-bit microcontroller manufactured by the Mitsubishi Corporation. The program settings are adjusted with this rotary switch here. And we also find a small electrically erasable PROM. It is an external memory chip for the microcontroller. Here we see a group of Darling transistor arrays and a standard quad operational amplifier. I'm not sure about the function of the op amps since I didn't have the time to properly reverse engineer this PCB to the last detail yet, but I'm quite confident that the transistor arrays are used as a part of the driver circuits for the triax down here, as well as for switching on and off the electromechanical relays which can also be found on this board. I will later try to find out how exactly the triax were connected to the microcontroller and that might be a topic for a future video. So to sum it up, what we have here is simply a conventional power supply plus a buck converter powering a microcontroller and some intermediate circuits by which it controls a couple of components that act as power switches for the various actuators and motors inside the dishwasher. But so much about that, let's perform some experiments. The first experiment will be about this component. It was used as a temperature sensor inside the dishwasher. And after performing an online search for the part number, I'm quite sure it's just an NTC thermistor encapsulated inside a closed stainless steel cylinder. This component, often just called NTC, will usually look more something like this. And you will often find it in inrush current limiting circuits, for example in large SMPS. The advantage of our special NTC is though that its tip can be safely submersed into a fluid, making it ideal for measuring a water temperature. It also could be inserted into a drilled hole in a heatsink by the way, making it universally useful for power electronics projects. But how can you reuse such an NTC thermistor as a crude temperature sensor? Well, the simplest way to do this is to make a voltage divider with the NTC plus a fixed resistor. According to the voltage divider rule, the voltage V2 will rise when the temperature of the NTC rises. Thus, it will be possible to at least measure a correlation of those values. So let's verify this in an experiment. What I have done here is the following. A pot with water is sitting on top of a camping cooker. The NTC thermistor as well as the temperature probe of my Fluke 87.5 will be submersed into the water. The Fluke on the left displays the temperature of the water while the DMM on the right measures the voltage V2 across the fixed resistor in the voltage divider. And we will make a few jumps in time to see what happens.
So what you can see is that the voltage rises as the temperature rises. But you can also see that there is not a simple linear proportionality between temperature and voltage. So in order to build a general purpose thermometer, a lot more effort would be required. But what you can easily do is to define discrete voltages that are coupled to discrete temperature values. If you would give a supply voltage of plus 5 volts to the voltage divider and then connect the center tap of the voltage divider to the ADC of a microcontroller, you could use this as a crude temperature sensor very easily. You could then program the microcontroller to do a certain thing when let's say 3 volts or 4 volts are present at the ADC input etc. The next component that I want to experiment with is this device that is known as an aquastop at least here in Germany. It basically is an electromechanical valve that is integrated in a water hose. Around the inner one a second outer hose is present that covers the inner tubing and power cord. In case the inner hose ruptures, water is supposed to flow inside the dishwasher through the outer tubing, while the aquastop valve would then be closed via the action of a float switch sitting inside the dishwasher. But more about the float switch in just a minute. First of all, I want to show you that an aquastop is actually a very versatile part that can be used as an electromechanically activated faucet or tap. For that, I attach an ordinary light switch and a power cord to the valve. And I install the aquastop to the faucet beneath my kitchen sink. Let me demonstrate how it works. By the way, the water that keeps flowing after the shutoff is just the water that is still stored inside the hose itself. Now let us combine this experiment with a float switch. The float switch is basically a piece of styrofoam that is attached to an electric switch. As soon as the water level beneath it rises and reaches the styrofoam, the switch is deactivated. Before I can use it, I have to determine its pinout. Since it actually has three contacts, one will be opening and one will be closing as the switch is activated. I have now connected the actively opening contacts in series with the light switch and let's see what happens. As you can see, the float switch disconnected the electromagnet inside the aquastop from the grid, effectively closing the valve. If you play with this, please pay a lot of attention. The float switch has open contacts that could come close to the water level. I recommend not to use the float switch on the mains directly, but to use it on a low voltage logic rail instead and use a relay to shut off the aquastop. Here you can see how you could connect the float switch via a transistor and a relay to the aquastop. But instead of doing that, I will now use a microcontroller to control the aquastop. And for that, I first have to build a small relay board according to the circuit diagram that you just saw. So, with the relay board connected, I write a primitive program in C in order to open and close the valve periodically. Let's see if it works. The valve is open for 2 seconds, then closed for 2 seconds, and so it goes on and on. But it would also be possible to let the controller wait for 23 hours and 59 minutes, then open the valve for 1 minute and so on. In other words, the combination of aquastop and microcontroller could be used to build a simple automated irrigation system or similar things. And now the last, but maybe most interesting part that I will talk about 
is this circulating pump of the dishwasher. It is typically based on an induction motor with motor capacitor. This motor type has some advantages, one of them being that it is a very quiet motor, another one that it is very long lived and suited for long term use because of the lack of your commutator. Still, the pump assembly is often very hard to reuse because it does not simply have one inlet and one outlet but several holes all over the place. On top of that, many different hoses with different rather outlandish diameters are often used, making it very hard to connect the motor to standard tubing and reuse it for every purpose you want. But in the meantime, I have solved that problem at least with this circulating pump that I have salvaged from another dishwasher some time ago. What I did is that I preheated the plastic tubes of inlet and outlet with a hot air gun and then inserted barely fitting standard 6mm 1/2 inch threaded hose barbs and then let the plastic cool down creating a tight fit around the threads. I'm also still waiting for a mail delivery bringing me a special water resistant adhesive that will hopefully allow me to create a perfect seal. I will also use that adhesive in conjunction with some other parts to close unwanted holes in pump enclosures in the future. In this case I could simply use a wine cork to close off a redundant outlet tube. In this way I managed to attach standard tubing to the circulating pump. In order to test it I also improvised a water basin by drilling a hole into this kitchen bowl and sealing it with a rubber ring. And here is the result. I'm still using a towel because the seals are not yet perfect, but as I said, I'm working on it. My long term goal is that I accomplish to use one of these pumps to build a cooling device like this one from my professional tick welding machine. But this is a topic for another video. So I hope that you like this video and if you want to support this channel, please consider donating a few bucks via PayPal or maybe even become a Patreon supporter. Links concerning both can be found in the description of this video. If you want to contact me, write me an email to inventordonations at gmail.com.